Hi, this is Bob Harrington from Stanford University on Medscape Cardiology and the Heart.org. Over the years of doing these podcasts, I've really enjoyed the opportunity to talk with colleagues and friends in the field who are doing interesting things, broadly defined. Today is a great example of that, of having a friend and colleague for many years, Rob Califf, who recently served as the commissioner of the Food and Drug Administration, and who now, is following that role, is doing some interesting things at Duke University, at Verily, in the tech community, at PCORNet, at Stanford University, and I'll say maybe more broadly, in the world of healthcare technology. So I hope that the listeners really enjoy the conversation. Rob Califf is the Fortin Professor of Cardiology in the Department of Medicine at Duke University. He's also recently been named the Vice Chancellor of Health Data Science at Duke University. He is the advisor to Verily, formerly known as Google Life Science. And we're also pleased that he's going to be spending some time with us on campus as an adjunct professor here at Stanford University. So, Rob, thanks for joining us here on Medscape Cardiology. Good to be here. So, Rob, you know, many in the community know you through many years of your work in cardiovascular research, particularly in large-scale clinical trials. And while you interacted with the FDA many, many times over the years, the last few years, you got a different vantage point, first as the deputy commissioner at FDA, and then for the last year of the Obama administration as the commissioner of the FDA. Let's start with the broadest question, why'd you decide to do that when asked? Well, you know, there are times in your life when you feel like you've accomplished certain things and you're ready for the next adventure. Up until a couple of years ago, that next adventure had always been on campus here at Duke as I moved from one job to another. But the time just seemed right to do something entirely different and the opportunity to go to FDA was something I'd really sort of always wanted to do. I think people know that. By nature, I'm an evaluator, and that's the ultimate evaluation machine. So you had an uh, interesting um, confirmation process <laughs> where well, your, your prior relationships with industry, which had been almost exclusively around clinical research, were heavily scrutinized. Talk a little bit about that experience. Well, first of all, it was. It, I feel like I got the best of all worlds because I went in as a civil servant. Um, a career employee at the FDA, where I was protected from the sort of pure political interchange. And I got to do a lot of work with the uh, medical products and tobacco areas reporting to me. So that's, you know, a little over half of the total FDA. Most of the rest of it deals with food. Um, And I came on the premise that it was likely I'd be asked to be commissioner, but it had been made clear to me that the president has to ask you to be commissioner. It's not something that you apply for. And eventually, I got uh, invited to the uh, Oval Office to meet one-on-one with the president. It was quite a fascinating meeting. The first 10 minutes were spent with the president telling me how much he hates Duke basketball and loves uh, the Tar Heels. And once we got that behind us, we had a fascinating discussion about technology development and its relevance to the well-being and the economy of the United States. And then you walk out of the Oval Office, you think, holy smokes, I've been one-on-one with the president. He's offered me a job. Uh, The world is great. And the next thing that happens is you get intercepted by a team of people who are your handlers who remind you that the president can offer you the job, but you don't have it until the Senate confirms the nomination. And that process was just amazing because, um, you know, relationships were not great between the administration and the Republican-led Senate. Uh, Fortunately, I had Senators Alexander and Burr who really uh, helped me get through it. And it turned out it was mostly the Democrats who didn't like the fact that I had um, an industry background. It was interesting to follow, wasn't it? Uh, Richard Burr, amongst the most conservative of uh, of Republican senators, actually was uh, was very much on your side. And uh, and I remember watching the open confirmation hearings, where he, in his role as being a North Carolina senator, also had the privilege of introducing you to his Senate colleagues. And he was quite laudatory in his remarks. And then we had the uh, the other side of the aisle maybe most notably with Senators Warren and Sanders, and uh, they weren't initially so favorable, were they? 
Well, here here I would distinguish between the two of them, and also it was really nice. Senator Burr introduced my granddaughter, who at the time was 12, to the Senate formally, which was, <clears throat> you know, fantastic for the family. But Senator Warren put me through hell, basically, um, but in the end, we became a big supporter. We spent a lot of time talking about how clinical trials work and why you need industry partnerships to get the right answer. You know, it's kind of interesting among, among all the things that politicians need to know, understanding exactly how clinical trials get done is not high on the list. So there's a widespread belief that the um, NIH actually does the trials or that the industry sponsor does the trials. And once uh, we went through it all, she really, you know, came to appreciate the model that we had developed here at Duke and that many academics used. Senator Sanders never really liked me very much, and that showed up at the at the hearing. But as I like to point out, my mom got him back. <clears throat> she was 88 at the time, a retired school teacher. And um, after the hearing, uh, while we were waiting along the side, she saw the Senate mailboxes and just wrote him a note and put it in this mailbox. Um, so I feel like uh, we, we came out even on that one. But he, <laughs> he never uh, really, um, I think, took the time to understand how the research actually gets done. Well, but not I, only that, it was very interesting in watching his remarks that um, for political theater, he likes to shout about drug prices. And uh, I did appreciate that you reminded him with uh, in a very collegial manner that uh, – uh, that the FDA actually did not set uh, pharmaceutical drug prices. And that didn't seem to deter him that you would not have the ability to set prices. No, it really didn't. And he, um, you know, but, you know, you learn they're all individuals. They all represent constituencies. Um, and uh, they all have pluses and minuses just like we do. And it was fascinating and interesting to learn how to uh, navigate that. And, of course, it culminates in, um, the most amazing um, decision about whether you get the job where each senator goes up one by one publicly on C-SPAN votes yes or no as to whether you should uh, get the job. So I got to sit and watch that, which was quite uh, interesting, but it, it came out well. And um, overall, it was a tremendous experience for me. You prevailed. It was quite a convincing bipartisan level of support. So then you move into the job, Rob, and in my conversations with you over that year, you really were having a good time. You really enjoyed the job, spending your days doing everything from hearing people defend the Constitution and the Bill of Rights and having discussions about freedom of speech uh, to things where you really got to see an amazing uh, dedication to science and the public health. Give the audience a couple of the highlights of what you walked away impressed with from how the FDA works that the average cardiovascular community member might not understand or might not appreciate. The FDA altogether is 22,000 people, 17,000 full-time government employees and 5,000 contractors, many of whom are there long-term to help with particular technical issues, but they're really dedicated to the public health. I think, as everyone knows, not terribly highly paid for the work that they do, but interfacing with 20% of the economy, which is what the FDA uh, regulates. And as commissioner, it was amazing to see the amount of scientific knowledge and expertise and blood, sweat, and tears that went into preparing uh, presentations for policy decisions to be made. Also, there's a fierce uh, protection of the role of the um, non-conflicted um, federal employee in making the decisions about individual products, something that I really came to appreciate. Because I can assure you, if you let the political system invade those individual product decisions, uh, there'll be no stopping it. And, um, you know, as commissioner, you're sort of the person in between the workforce um, and all the politicians. And again, well, I'd reiterate, the politicians are not bad people. They just are under a lot of pressure and often get fed bad information by people. Well, you would be one of the few commissioners that had a deep understanding of the clinical science that goes into uh, producing the data and focusing on drugs and devices as opposed to the food and tobacco part of your job, or as you like to talk about, the cosmetics part of your job. On the science side, one of the areas that 
where you underwent a great deal of scrutiny was around the muscular dystrophy um, issue where a product was really felt to be unfavorable for approval by the review agency. When it got to a higher level of scientific review, it was viewed favorably. And then you wrote, I thought, a very interesting uh, decision where you waded less into the science, but you defended the policy approval or the science approval process. Do you want to comment on this, Rob? Because this is something that has gotten a great deal of press um, as people think about the, the level of evidence required for FDA approval um, and how common diseases might vary from, uh, from rare diseases. Uh, it brings in the issues of patient advocacy groups, a lot of things that people know about but may not understand how it all comes together. Well, first, I, first, I just want to point out that um, it's interesting how often the press and popular discourse gets off on uh, the spectator sport part of this, and because so much of the economy is affected by decisions that FDA makes. And of course, people love the personalities, and when there's an argument, but the fundamental issue that um, just just a couple of quick things about this: uh, the FDA is given special power by law in the drug approval process for when there's a uh, disease uh, that's severe, like life-threatening, uh, for which there's no treatment, and the process uh, was called accelerated approval. Under those conditions, the FDA is instructed to look um, at all the available data, including unvalidated biomarkers, um, to make a decision based on the totality of all the evidence that can be brought to bear. And then, uh, if the decision is favorable, there's a requirement for the sponsor to then do uh, definitive clinical trials that would meet the usual standard in the post-market phase. So that's what happened with this drug for Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. For the cardiologists in the audience who don't deal with this every day, that's a uh, rare genetic disease that affects boys who typically die in their teens or late 20s after a progressive downhill course. And while steroids have a slight effect, most likely there's really no proven treatment that changes the course of the disease. And so this compound uh, that was uh, studied and brought to bear um, was really poorly done, I have to say. And in my, I won't go through the details here in the interest of time, but um, in the opinion that we wrote, we did dive very deeply into the science. But the ultimate decision for me, this is the first time in history that an internal argument in the FDA had been appealed to the commissioner. And of course, as commissioner, you're a political appointee. And I basically said um, the highest level of civil servant should make this decision, which was Janet Woodcock. And having, having worked with Janet for years, I had no qualms about her uh, competence and also her interest in what's good for the patient. So this should in no way be interpreted as a precedent for the typical drug approval. It was just a special circumstance. And the key issue is to keep politics out of uh, approval decisions. Well said, and I'm glad that we were able to uh, get you on the record of talking about that. My guest today has been Rob Califf from Duke University, Stanford University, and Verily. Rob, thanks for joining us today on Medscape Cardiology and the Heart.org. 